The Germans had us placed in boxcars, and we just pulled into a railroad yard, and all of a sudden we heard two planes peel off and come down and strafe the cars. You hear them peel off and come down, boy, I said, boy, you're setting ducks here. You can't move, you can't get out, the boxcars are locked. And uh, you wondered, what can I do? You know, how can I get out of here? You could hear the uh, splinters of the bullet, you know, coming through and hitting and people screaming and falling down. One GI managed to get through the window and open the doors on the boxcars. And we formed uh, outside there in the field a US POW with the personnel. And then the planes didn't come back again. Then we went back and put the wounded and uh, dead on the platform there in the yard. And that got you a taste of what war is like. Shoveling there. Yeah, I got the uh, porch and the roof on the uh, east side now, and I've been out here on the uh, barn building where I storage stuff, shoveling out there. So I'm trying to finish that up. Here's my tuggy cat. to go. Old Tug. There's another one. Place full of black cats, you know. If we had three more, we'd have six. Hello, I'm Rachel White. I'm 83 years old. I lived uh, with my wife of 61 years. I married uh, Shirley White, my wife. That was when uh, a big moment in my life. Having two uh, wonderful boys, Mike and R.D. White, and uh, being able to play in sports, hunt, and I had decent health, and I could generally do about anything I wanted to do. And uh, even though I've got up in age, I still try to keep moving and keep going. Even though I'm 83, I'm still pretty active. I'll, I'll even climb on the roof, get on the ladder, knock ass off the roof, and if it needs shoveling, I'll do that too. I enjoy people, visit with them, and uh, playing jokes. I'm sort of interested when I'm visiting with people. Maybe I'll inquire about where they work, uh, what kind of car they drive, if they're going to school yet. And to get a conversation going, that generally uh, they enjoy that, and, uh, and I find out uh, just who the who they are, and they know a little about me too. Under 
during uh, Christmas time, during the winter months, uh, you have uh, flashbacks, uh, marching uh, all day, no food, grabbing what you can that's been frozen, and sleeping in barns overnight in hay and not really keeping warm. And your hands and feet are real cold, spending two weeks on the road there before we got back to the POW camp without food. The Germans gave us nothing. Over six years ago that this happened and the memories come back, you may try to forget it, but you're forced to uh, think about it and you just can't get it out of your mind. One thing now, never say quit. I can't and just keep pushing and keep going. No matter what they did or threw at you, you kept plugging along. Growing up back home in West Virginia, yeah, I, I didn't have any idea going into service, but my brother went in, Mondale went in, in, in 1940. Uh, so later, uh, appealed to me that uh, I'll, give a, I'll give the service a shot. So I went down and enlisted. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Back home, it was strictly coal mines in the in, a, in the county I lived in. And if I hadn't went in the army and seen opportunities by going in the army, I'd probably been there in West Virginia, still probably working the coal mines. We'd uh, go up on the mountaintops and pick huckleberries up there. All. That was a time when you'd run into a lot of rattlesnakes up on the huckleberry field because they was laying up there waiting for birds to come in, the way they caught birds, uh, the snakes there. All. So we picked huckleberries, which is probably about a two, two or three mile one way getting there and then coming back, be about six miles. We lived uh, squirrel hunting and rabbit hunting. We was pretty good shots. To get a good supply of squirrels there when we went out, we knew how to hunt. And we didn't miss too much because uh, we couldn't hardly afford the ammo. I mean, I went out once with one shell in the 22 to get one squirrel. And the idea I came back lucky with one squirrel. We grew up there in Wharton, West Virginia with a family of eight. And things during the Depression years were real tough in there. Our house was a, a just one big room. Some place you could look and see outdoors through the building there. There wasn't any siding put on or nothing. And I think we had about three beds or four beds in the house. We had a coal and wood burning stove, which you could bake stuff too. You could bake bread and you could bake cornbread and biscuits or uh, such. Dad was very religious-like. He was a minister up at Burt at the, at the church, and you had to attend Sunday school every Sunday. If you didn't attend Sunday school every Sunday, you better be sick, because otherwise you stayed inside of the yard that day. You couldn't go out and play anywhere else. Mother was a hard, hard working, trying to keep the family going, sewing and cooking, and doing what she can to stretch out food. You got holes in your clothes. Mother did the patching. Most time, any clothes you had had been patched. You keep wearing them and patching them, wearing them and patching them. Entertainment, we had a ball field above the house, so we used to play football up in the field now. we go down to my uh, cousin's uncle place. We played a lot of horseshoe. We played a lot of croquet down there, too. Yeah, that broke me in on horseshoes, yeah. That helped me. <laughs> and helped me later in life, yeah, I win a few games, you yeah. know. Once in a while, they'd make molasses, and they'd feed the stalks through the grinding machine. So we went up there lots of times, took a spoon with us, and uh, we could spoon some of the molasses, which was hot. And the old horse was going around in circles, 
And that way they, he was squeezing the uh, sap out of the sugar cane to get the juice to make the molasses. Wintertime, we couldn't afford to buy coal. So I dig, there was a couple of small coal mines local nearby. So uh, one of them was almost a half a mile down a railroad track. So I'd go down and dig coal in the mines there and carry it up the track. And I know I'd have to, the lumps would sort of pierce your shoulder. I'd have to bend over and change shoulders with it. Of course, it's bad going in them mines down there below because you could got gas or kill too, which was real dangerous. The creek went down in front of the house. We just had a log across that we went across when it was down. But when the, we got heavy rain or heavy thaw from any snow or anything, that river would get up real high. When the water got up and took our bridge out, we all had stilts. So to get groceries over the store, we had to go down and cross the river with them stilts. And we was pretty good at them. I know a, a five pound bucket of lard, I held my mouth several times, bringing that back, just, it was swinging in my mouth. Well, I was glad when I got on the other side. Lucky I didn't have any teeth broken. Well, I went to Van High School, and that was seven miles from the house, and uh, went down on the bus and back on the bus. I took biscuits for lunch, and I know the people that didn't have much, the ones that eat biscuits, we got by ourselves like. And the ones that can afford light bread or the regular bread, but we didn't associate with. Huh? I, I went out for football. The only thing bad about football, I had to hitchhike or walk home. So I went out for football and played tackle. And a few times I had to walk home and train hitchhiking. Uh, I finally gave up sports uh, as far as football because uh, uh, seven miles is a long way to go to walk, you know, after practicing football. We always feuded with the uh, boys up at Burt. We generally get in rock battles. Even at night, you couldn't, you, you, you could hear the rocks come in and hit, and you were just throwing rocks as fast as you could throw in that direction they was coming in. Uh, my first cousin, uh, one bounced and hit him in the eye, and he lost his eyesight in one rock battle. I have to be down on that swinging bridge, uh, cable bridge down there below the house. Me and my sister and another girl was crossing. Here comes two guys from Burt across. We met it in the middle of the bridge. And he pulled the pistol out and pointed at my stomach. Said he's gonna blow my stomach out. And I froze there. I know if I did anything, he'd shoot me back then. You know, they didn't, uh, didn't make any difference, seemed like. Back then, growing up, uh, a lot of people getting shot, you know, a lot of barroom fights and this and that. So he went, he finally let me loose, and I went on across the bridge. So later in the afternoon, I happened to be home. I happened to look down the railroad tracks, and here come them two boys up the track that, that had the point of the pistol in my stomach. So I went in, I took the old 12 gauge shotgun, it was single shot. I had the 12 gauge like this, and they, had, they was pointing the pistol at me. And finally they got so they backed up the railroad track, and I kept following right along. And nobody fired. If somebody had fired, I know they'd shot back. If I'd have, well, if I'd have shot first, I'd have dropped them because uh, <laughs> there's no chance. And boy, that's how lucky I come end up not being in jail. <laughs> My dad died young. Uh, he died in 1939. Dad died at home. He had uh, high blood pressure, no medication, and uh, nothing to treat it with. And uh, my uncle made a regular pine box and lined it with uh, sheets, white sheets. And uh, that was his casket when dad was buried. And, uh, uh, he was just, after they dug the hole, that box went right down in the ground, and that's what uh, he was buried in, this regular homemade uh, wooden pine box. 
My oldest brother, he finished college and he went on his own teaching. And Mondell kept the family going. He worked there in the coal mines there at Wharton, West Virginia. And later he moved out and went into the service. So it left me, the, the oldest one of the family outside of my mother, to keep the family going. After dad died, uh, things was really tough. Pinto beans was seven days a week. Pinto beans and cornbread was a seven day a week deal. And uh, breakfast was always uh, biscuits. So at night, if you wanted a snack, it was cornbread and pinto beans or cornbread and milk. So make up your mind, it was one of those. And that's what you had to snack on if you got hungry. I worked some for my uncle to just to get by. I worked up in his orchard. He furnished us with apples, which mother would can and make apple butter. So that helped a lot right there, the apples. We could, uh, she can a lot of apples, make apple butter and make apple jelly. So that, that made breakfast a little easy. Boone County there, Van and Wharton, yeah, nothing, nothing in there but uh, soft coal companies. I got a job with the coal mines down there in the Van, but it was outside work, and we was building, uh, we did a lot of, they did a lot of concrete work, and they was putting the foundation in. They had wheelbars. We run about 30, 25, 30 yards, seemed like, on these boards full of concrete in them wheelbars, and then dump it. Boy, I'll tell you, that was hard work, wheeling that wheelbar full of cement. Finally, uh, I decided that I'd go enlist in the Army. So I left home and enlisted in the Army. I joined the service there in uh, January the 20th, 1941, and I was sent to Fort Knox, Kentucky, and took my basic training there and was assigned to the 1st Armored Division. Move it, move it! Exercising, had to crawl on your hands and knees, and they was firing live ammo over you. You had to crawl through some barbed wire and uh, into the trench and back out. Oh, Sergeant came and he said, we're going to train you on tanks. And uh, to start the thing, you had a blank cartridge like a shotgun shell and you'd insert it in and that would fire and get the engine running. It seemed like you was enclosed in something and couldn't get out sort of too, you know, boxed in like uh, once you get in there and they shut the hatch and this and that. And yeah, we just had a slit there we viewed out the front to drive. We practiced out in different terrains and uh, up the banks and down, rough riding out through and pretty good speed, you know, going pretty good speed. So I was training day by day there on tanks, driving the tanks out. Sometimes you, you enjoyed it, and other times you didn't care for it, it seemed like. And later, uh, they told me that I'd been picked for a cadre to go to Pine Camp with the 4th Armored Division. They was forming a new division up there. All. And I was signed to the tank outfit up there. All. So I was with the 4th Armored Division, Company B. First time I've uh, been up north, and I found the winters up here real cold, real cold. I was talking to one of my friends that was a cook in the mess hall. I told him, what a night I went through on guard duty last night. And I said it was around 37 below. And he said, well, we're short a cook. He said, talk to the mess sergeant and then go from there. So I went to the mess sergeant and told him I'd uh, be interested in uh, going to cook and baker school. So he talked to the first sergeant and through the company commander. Later they sent me to the cook and baker school 
and they sent me to the officer's mess where I cooked there for over a year. While I was at Pine Camp, we called a cab to go off post. So on the way out, before we got to the guard shack there, to, it came on the radio that the Japs had hit Pearl Harbor. President Roosevelt said in a statement today that the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, from the air. One guy said, well, uh, he said, that looks bad for us. He said, it won't be long before we'll be in the Pacific. And uh, no one even mentioned about uh, Hitler, but uh, the reaction was that we'd be shipped to the Pacific to fight the Japs. When I went into service, I didn't realize that uh, we was gonna end up being in war with Germany or even Japan. Yeah, that was the last thing on my mind. Didn't think a thing about war. When I got any leave time or pastime, ended up going to Adams, where uh, I met my wife Shirley in Adamsville. I met her with another girl on the street there in Adams. I hollered at them and went started talking to them and got acquainted. I said I couldn't go out with them unless I asked my folks, you know. I mean, that was the thing you did in those days. You didn't go out with just anybody. Your folks had to know something about them. So we, we went up and I introduced him to my folks. Surely now I was planning on going downtown and maybe to the movies, but I got it talking with her father and got interested in uh, World War I. In World War I, uh, Pete Whedon was stationed in the Ardennes, and that I, had, I ended up in the same location as he did in World War II. So we ended up visiting most of the afternoon. I didn't think we'd ever get to the movies. I'm trying to get him out to go to the We had a movie theater there in Adams Inn. Yeah, they took to me uh, right off and uh, really uh, did everything they could to, you know, to please me and keep Shirley and I happy, you know? Very pleasant family. We was planning on getting married, but I got shipped to South Carolina in March 43. They was gonna form the 106th Infantry Division. So I was put on a train and sent down now. I graduated from Adams High School, 1943. I graduated one week, we got married the next week. I went to South Carolina, he was in Fort Jackson at that time. I had a friend that she was going down to New York, and she took me to New York and helped me change trains. I had to change from New York Central to Penn Central, and it went down the coast. And uh, it was full of military personnel, and they had to turn the lights off at night so they couldn't be seen out in the ocean. They were worried about U-boats. So at night, everything was blacked out along the coast. she come down on the train, and. Uh... We got married there in South Carolina in 1943, uh, June the 28th. Seemed like in a way it came on quick. You know, uh, your mind was more or less, you know, you're gonna be sent overseas and you got your soldier duty to do. And uh, more or less, if you get married, where, where are you gonna be uh, located or stationed or such? and. Uh, Seemed like everything happened quickly. You know, all of a sudden, uh, here I am married. I was with the reconnaissance outfit, the 106th Division, which they call the Golden Line, and I was in headquarters platoon. I went through some more basic training at Fort Jackson. 
and then back into the kitchen again, and uh, we got our complete personnel. I think it was around 147. Later, we were sent to Camp Atterbury, Indiana. We was getting uh, supplied to go overseas, all the equipment and other odds and ends that we needed to go to Europe. We got uh, some half tracks and then M8 uh, reconnaissance cars, uh, rubber tires on them with a 37 millimeter gun and on the front of them and a machine gun on top. When I was stationed at Camp Atterbury, Indiana, Shirley decided she'd come down to see me. Well, as a group of us decided we'd go down to NCO Club and uh, play cards that afternoon. So I didn't know she's coming down, so she came down. She went in to the, see Captain Ball. He was in charge of the, our outfit. She mentioned to him I'm Rick White's wife, and I like to know, I like to see him. She said, he said, he's out in the field with the troops. So he said, I'll send the driver out to get him. And they sent the Jeep out to get me, and he come back, and he said, White is not out there with the troops. So later that afternoon, I drug in around 4 o'clock, figuring I was safe, and I found out I was in trouble. Shirley was there in the... Uh, in the uh, office with the captain, and uh, he said, I'm gonna have to restrict you for 30 days. I said, well, my wife's down here, and we're gonna have a, get a place in town for her to stay. Well, he said, well, I, d I don't wanna see you in town. More or less, you know, if you go, don't let me see you. So I went into town regular anyway. That restriction didn't bother me a bit. After 30 days, it was lifted. I left uh, Camp Atterbury and they shipped us to uh, Camp Mount Stanley's and we was waiting for overseas duty and we gonna be we could be shipped out any 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 minute. And I ended up cooking now with a mess hall, feeding the whole division now, which I think we had around twenty-five cooks and around hundred KPs on duty at a time. Shirley was expecting uh, Mike, my first baby. So I was there about three or four days, and I said, well, I'm gonna make one more run home. So I ended up getting a pass from one of the guys that's stationed there year round. So I filled out the pass for Syracuse, New York. So I went down to get on the train out of Boston. MPs came back and checked my pass. It was okay. And I ended up in Syracuse and I hitched take into Adams. I stayed the weekend. Monday, I came back to Syracuse and then trained it into Boston and then back to camp again. And they had all my, all my bedding and all my clothes rolled up and in the supply room. And it looked like they figured I wasn't coming back. But a company commander bawled me out. Only thing that happened to me, and that didn't bother me a bit, and then a couple of three days later, we was on the boat headed for overseas. Not having anything to go by before, you, you just uh, a sort of adventure more than anything else. You know, you don't you don't sink in how dangerous it's going to be. I mean, it's just you're all excited about the war and the soldiers, and you know, and you just don't think about the consequences too much. You begin to think what, what's you know what we're going to run into on the other side, and uh, what part of the war are we going to be put in up north or in the middle section, and it seemed like it really didn't scare me. I mean, I wasn't frightened. Uh, I wasn't scared. I mean, I was going to whatever happens, going to go happen. It was a large ship, and uh, I know farther out we got in the ocean. 
I was looking back at the land, and I could still see land way back there on the shoreline, and I was getting seasick already, and uh, we, we weren't too far out from shore yet, and really it took effect on me quick, and I was seasick all the way over. We was crammed down in the lower deck and not much room in uh, them old swinging cots like, you know. Everybody was in a different mood than it was back at uh, before we left. Everybody was more quieter, you know, and probably thinking, you know, what lies ahead. We hit some rough water going over. The ocean got real rough. I mean, I, I could see the boat go down and up. There's a cruiser like way over here going. You go down and up, you couldn't even see the cruiser. You go down like that, and oh, you see the big waves coming in. They said we did a lot of zigzagging on kind of the U-boats in the ocean now. I didn't realize going over, and I didn't think any about the U-boats might sink us. I didn't even, it didn't bother me at all. And here it was, that was real dangerous, you know what I mean, going over, because they'd sink a lot of ships out of them U-boats, submarines. We were seven days on the ocean going over, and we landed on the western part of England. We was trucked to our outfit stationery. We sort of relaxed and played cards and uh, played checkers, and uh, we were located in a quiet little spot. There's a bakery in town, and I got acquainted with the guy. He let us use his ovens. He had nice brick ovens. We could use that to bake bread or cakes or anything or pies. England there on the LST and was headed for Lee Harve and that was all bombed and tore up. There wasn't many, I don't remember any buildings left at all. That was really a, a bunch of rubble as well, the buildings. And we loaded on deuce and a half trucks. As we drove on the highway, that was a little different feeling after seeing the first taste of what the war has done to the coast of France now and uh, what's been destroyed, the buildings and such. We was placed up on front, you know, being reconnaissance, we was up on the front of, to get information for the outfits, you know, 106, uh, Empathy boys. We was going to replace the second infantry division, so we moved in to our location, and we replaced the unit there. They told us we was put in here in the rest area, and nothing's going to happen. So we just going to relax and and stay put for a few days. I didn't think it was German and 50 miles of us. You know, they said. You all are gonna relax and nothing's gonna happen and uh, and uh, later uh, you'll probably be sent into combat somewhere.
we were sleeping in our bunks, and all of a sudden, all this artillery and mortar and uh, rocket fire came in. Boy, we jumped out of bed <laughs> and grabbed our guns and beat it downstairs. This is it now. We're in combat. You can hear the shells coming in, hitting out in the street. The building we stored our ammo in was hit, and that was exploding and blowing up there. Small on fire shooting, bang, 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 and machine gun rounds going off, and M1 rounds going off, far flying and smoke. Everybody was just sitting still. There wasn't much you could do with that heavy fire coming in, so I sort of propped myself up on the floor. I had the helmet over my head. You didn't know where one of them shells was going to hit our building next or not. Right then, you were scared. And all of a sudden, there was a loud crash. The stonework came down on me. German 88 shell came through and went through and ran out the other side, put two great big holes in the, in the stone building. Said, boy, we was lucky. If that went off, it'd kill about a dozen of us in the building there. One feller, he sort of went out, out of his mind, took two of us to hold him. He was wanting to run out of the building. He was screaming and hollering. So uh, we had to hold him down. And then later, after things quieted down, the captain took him and left us there. Uh, I mean, when things get hot, why is he leaving and leaving us up here on the front? And everybody was uh, chatting, you know, we don't, when the wire leader left, where the captain, why the captain left. The artillery quieted down, so I had to guard the back door with a grease gun, 45. I was guarding the back door in case any Germans, uh, infantry showed up. I was there to get rid of them. I could look out and see out in the open space how you know, the Germans are. I went upstairs. I was shooting out of the uh, attic window. I looked way over and I spotted a German. I raised the sights on my rifle. I started firing at him, and he'd run a little bit and hit the ground. And then he'd get up and go again. I'd fire and he'd hit the ground. About five times I shot at him. It was a military truck there, and he got behind the truck. So I, I just shot at the truck after that. I didn't know where I hit it or not. The platoons out there got overrun. The officer took off, and uh, who's around to run things? You know, who around to be in, in charge? So I just took things in my own hand. I said, I don't know about the rest of it, but I'm making a break for it. And I started out through the field, and here come the mess sergeant, and I think it was about five of us. And the mess sergeant, more or less, I'm leading the whole bunch. I'm just a corporal, T5. And the mess sergeant, he's coming along, and the rest of them. And we were standing up, and I said, the boys, we better hit the ground. Them bullets are getting awful close. Boy, you hear them bullets zinging. I don't know why we didn't get hit. I hear them going, zing, zing, by my ear. And uh, so we hit the ground and started crawling over towards that silo over there, on this road over there. And where in the world am I taking these boys to? I don't know. So we get over to the silo. We weren't there too long. When a American half-track came down, we got in the canvas vehicle underneath the cover, and then down the road we went. As we drove farther down the road, 
we run right into a town of Germans, and it was all over the place, in the buildings and everywhere. All of a sudden, bang, we got hit in the front end and overturned. I didn't hear the shell coming or nothing, it just wham. Once that hit, you just faded out for a minute as if you, you know, you was knocked unconscious. I got up and sort of halfway dizzy and, you know, yeah, not all well. My ears was ringing and I lost my hearing. I sort of looked around and, and looked at the vehicle. I was behind the driver, he was killed. That was my first, uh, I mean, look at an American soldier that was killed. And, you know, you thought about his family and, I mean, you really felt, felt funny. Most of the other personnel that was with us in the half track got shrapnel wounds, nothing serious. A mess sergeant uh, showed me a piece of shrapnel and he showed me his helmet and helmet liner and then the shrapnel went through his helmet and must have spun around in there and finally went through the liner and he got cut, uh, uh, cut on the head, but nothing serious. But uh, I mean, it was bleeding, but uh, it didn't penetrate, you know, that's how lucky he was. The Germans moved in and captured us. They come up and they searched you and they took anything, to any paperwork, pocketbooks, anything. And I lost my watch and wedding ring, you know, the Germans took it. They put us on uh, five or six trucks. Americans that had been captured, they started circling around. We spent about an hour I don't believe they knew exactly where they was going. And all of a sudden, we came to a stop. I looked ahead, and I see a patrol of American troops coming with the rifles drawn. So they came up and captured the Germans. I sat on the truck, and the last guy on the back was a, a German guard, and on the other side was a German soldier, too. So when we got recaptured, I got his P-38, and I got his burp gun. And uh, I felt pretty good over that. Really a nice feeling there that we got recaptured back. We stayed on the trucks and we rode back to where they was operating on wounded, you know, troops in the woods there. And we went through the first aid deal there, which I couldn't hear good, but it got generally better, but it still, I had ringing in my ears, which I still have today. We sort of tried to get a little bit of rest at night, and next morning we moved out. The whole outfit was re retreating back, but as we got near a uh, pretty good sized hill, and we come under heavy fire, so everybody left the vehicles, and the first move I made, I got sort of under my vehicle for protection where I could shoot out. That was bad because they were headed zeroed in on the roads, and they was knocking out the vehicles, so. We run for cover into the pines. I took off my helmet and dug myself a slit trench. The word got around my mouth that to save more people from being killed and wounded that uh, we was given up, we swindering. Then the Germans come up the hill at you hands up in the back of your head like this. It was sort of a heartbreaking feeling because uh, before I would got re recaptured back and felt good about it and I couldn't figure why this would happen again so quick. Uh, I wasn't looking forward, uh, forward for being recaptured this quick again. I thought maybe we was in better shape and, and not, not cut off and surrounded like we was. There was a group of about a hundred or to the left of me and there was some medics there on the right, too. The captain said to me, he says, uh, are you a medic? I said, yes, I am. And I said, I got captured yesterday, and they took my bands off my shoulder and off my helmet. Well, he said, fall in, we can use you. There were stories like in World War I that they exchanged medics back and forth over the line. That was sort of on my mind, and uh, maybe I ended up in the hospital or something there helping out. <coughs> The large group was moved out by German troops. We had to go up on the hill and carry off wounded down to this 
village. And it was a large building there, all blacked out, real dark. Everything was blacked out. So we put the Germans up front and Americans in the back to be operated on there and taken care of by the doctors and medics there in the building. And then we was taken over to another building where we spent the night. And uh, on the way over, I noticed a dead American uh, laying there on the ground. So next day, we, uh, we dug a grave and buried him and put his dog tags on the cross uh, for him. And uh, we, I think we was there about three days. I don't remember any food or nothing, no kind of nourishment. And uh, sort of ate a little bit of snow for water. You know, he got a little bit of snow for water. And uh, one evening they come and got us and lined us up. And there's about, uh, I don't know, I think about six, six German troops. And uh, they lined us up, there's 12 of us. We started marching off, and I said to them, I said to the rest of the boys, I said, they're going to, I think they're going to take us down here and shoot us. And I said, you better make a run for the guy nearest to you who's got a gun. I said, I'm going to go for this guy right here on my right. And it uh, seemed like we walked for a couple of hundred yards, came to a building, and uh, and they said, you know, we had to, we had to go in this little building and uh, it was full of hay. So I told the boys, I said, they're gonna burn the building down with us in it. But nothing happened. I was glad to see daylight come and we buried ourselves in hay in there for the night, trying to keep warm. And next morning they got us and we started marching again and we ended up with a bigger group. So I stuck with that group all the way back to uh, Stalag 4B, the group that I got with. Uh, and uh, we marched all day up maybe 10 and 10 o'clock at night or 11 till we come to some small village, farm village that had dairy cows. And uh, they'd say, head for the barns, get in the barns. So I'd run to the house and try to get some food and they'd give you a piece of bread or something. And then uh, you'd go out and get in the barn, try to get in the hay for the night. One day you thought about the other personnel back in your unit and what are they going to do with me? And then, uh, you know, you had uh, 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 thoughts about home. And uh, I was wondering more or less what's going to happen with the weather way it is and things are, things are really getting bad here. You know, snowing and rough weather and I'm not dressed properly anyway. I haven't got any winter gear on just for tags and a field jacket. It was sub-zero weather and snowy, and uh, as far as food, uh, no water or food was given to you, so he marched all day. Same routine uh, on the road and then uh, into the barns, and then the same deal next morning, up before daylight, and there you go again, marching on the road. to give up you kept pushing and you figured things will be better sooner or later and you was looking for for better times you know maybe some food later somewhere along the line which uh, it didn't happen 
I noticed when I was walking there, it was a dead body in the mud and the snow, and people were just walking on him, just like it was uh, the earth stepping on the body. We went through a heavy pine forest. We came up on a big tiger tank while marching there. I mean, I could have touched it. I was going to touch it and didn't. That sort of put a chill on you. You know, seeing a tank at large compared with our tanks, you know. I was wondering, what how in the world can they knock one of these tanks out? We came to this railroad yard and we got on these boxcars, it was about 60 per car, and there wasn't any sanitary conditions in there. Or in my car, there wasn't even a bucket for anybody who had to use a toilet. And inside the boxcar, you was jammed tightly in there. You know, there's not much room and you, you had to stand up. They wasn't even laying down or sitting position, you know. Some of them slumped down like energy, some of them slumped down like a binge your food. I was in the right-hand corner. I wasn't in the middle of the car because I could stand up better leaning against the side of the boxcar. You wondered where they're taking you, what's going to happen, and uh, what the Germans are going to do to you when you get to the camp or where they're taking us to. On Christmas Eve, uh, December 1944, the Germans had us placed in boxcars. We pulled into this railroad yard, and uh, two British Spitfires came down and strafed us. You hear them peel off and come down. Boy, I said, boy, you're setting ducks here. You can't move, you can't get out. The boxcars are locked. The guards took off. They took off away from there. And uh, you wondered, what can I do? You know, how can I get out of here? You could hear the uh, splinters of the bullet, you know, coming through and hitting and people screaming and falling down. It had a small window in the car and one end. They had barbed wire over the window where it would be hard to get out. Another boxer, the soldier, a small GI climbed out, dropped down. He started to open the doors of the boxcars. Seemed like everything moved we fast. Seemed like we was out in the field in no time and formed the USPOW out in the field there on the snow. The planes didn't come back again to strafe us. Two planes tipped their wings and then shot back up in the sky again. Then we went back and put the wounded and the dead on the platform there in the yard. On the road again, there's one town we walked through, the Germans, the kids and the mothers was out there, and they was kicking and throwing stuff at you as you went by. Kids trying to kick you in the ankle, some kind of a treatment there you didn't want to happen, you know. We uh, came to another railroad yard, and we got on the train. It seemed like we sat in the train quite a while before we pulled out. So uh, then you was wondering how soon you're going to be strafed and bombed again. So finally we took off. The old train took off. Same deal. I got back in a corner where I could lean up against the wall, balance myself better. And the people in the middle, that made it bad for them because the car was shifting and you were staggering like. And more people seemed to be dropping to their knees from lack of food and and uh, all we've had is snow, more or less. And uh, the uh, after about, I'd say about three hours, we pulled into another railroad yard. And uh, we just got off the train, and somebody said, uh, quickly hit the ditches. So we took running away from the railroad yard. And we went down, hit both sides of the road into the ditches. And you could look back, and here comes the bombers. And you could see the vapors of the bombs coming down. And they bombed that railroad yard.
the ground was shaking where we was at. I looked back once and the car looked like it just raised right off the ground. Just went right up in the air, just blew it, blew it to pieces. If I'd have been in that car, there wouldn't have been nothing left of us. We left uh, on the 17th. We got to the POW camp on the 31st of uh, December. We came to Stalag 4B and there was a framework up. You went underneath it and it set up for a Stalag 4B. We went in and there was a soup line there, rhubarb soup in it, mostly watered down. They said uh, grab a can off the ground and uh, I got in line and they gave me some rhubarb soup. So I just tipped it up and poured it down. I went back and got in line again. Now here the German officer said no seconds, so I stayed right in line. I said, well, you're gonna have to throw me out. So I stayed in line and I got a second shot at it. it looked like it's sort of like maggots in our soup. The first three or four days there, he, he was looking more closely at your food, you know, what you was getting. But later, it seemed like he didn't pay any attention after that. They probably was in there, but you just went ahead and downed it. Once you started eating that rutabaga soup, uh, boy, your bowels was really tore up. As we marched in, we could see Russian soldiers. There was soldiers with wooden shoes also, and there's three, four different nations in that compound. They had the triple fence up with a path in the middle with barbed wire and that went to the towers where the German guard was up there with a machine gun. He could look down, you could look up there and see him sitting up there with a machine gun. They moved us up little buildings or huts and it was controlled by the British. I got friends with a small built uh, GI and he was from Georgia so we, we we hung around together, and uh, and I just called him Georgie. I never did uh, find out his real name, and him and I generally did our sticking together and visiting and talking. Every morning, you'd have to fall out. Your, your, your hut would fall out in a separate location outside and line up, and they'd count you. you, you you'd stand out there maybe uh, 15 or 20 minutes and they'd count the, the troops in this uh, in our building, our compound, our barracks. That was a cold deal. Every morning out there and stand, and it seemed like they were slow counting. So they had a head count every morning to see if anybody had escaped. Generally around 10.30 in the morning, they'd bring in the rutabaker soup and maybe five little small taters, real small, and you got a piece of cheese and a spoonful of sugar. And it was about 15 of us on a loaf of that German sawdust bread. <laughs> I didn't move around too much in the camp. I figured maybe if it was some disease or in this other building or such, uh, I just stayed put in my building and uh, there's enough sickness the way it was. I just had a certain area that I stayed uh, nearby. If the sun was shining, we'd get on the warm side of the building where the sun would hit us. And we'd kneel down there in the sun, and that felt warm, you know. But you had to be careful. If you raised up all at once, you'd black out like. So when you raised up from the sitting position, you gotta come up real slow. Generally in the morning, the wagon would come in with the horses pulling it, and it'd, have, it'd be full of taters. The uh, Russians, they would run and grab taters off the back end of it. Make a, it'd be a German guard in the back walking. They'd make a quick scoot in there and grab a couple of taters and take off, because they was desperate. I, I don't believe they fed them hardly at all, because they carried them out of there regular. The Russians had a tough go of it there. Which, we did too, but it seemed to me like, I don't believe they was getting fed hardly at all. So one day the Russians, we was out and the Russian made a run for the wagon 
German guard, or he just raised up and shot the Russian and that killed him. That was about three days I was there, and they kept around and gave us their POW tags there. I had that around my neck and uh, never took it off. It stayed around my neck all the time I was uh, POW. We slept on a hard, flat board like a bunk bed. There's three of us down. At night, we'd switch. One night, you was in the middle, and then every other, you'd be on the end, and finally, you'd, the third night, you'd be in the middle, which was warm. We had a very thin blanket. It seemed like it was so cold. It really seemed to me like you couldn't really get a good night's sleep. You, you was up going to the bathroom. Everybody had diarrhea. So when the guy, if you could sleep, the other guy would wake you up. He'd have to go and if he was in the middle, he'd got to climb over you and go to the bathroom. One night there, uh, uh, I, I think I was in, I, I think I was in the middle. We bunked with a Chinese American now. I was trying to climb out over him and he got grouchy at me and I got grouchy back at him and we threw a few slaps at each other. And then the British hollered out, you bloody Yanks, uh, you shut up or we'll throw you right out in the snow. So we knew better, we, we, we shut up because otherwise they'd throw us out of there because we was outnumbered about 48 to 10. One night there, one of our Merkin boys, which was bad, he got into the British food over there. I don't know what it was. And he got caught. So they took him outside and the hut commander beat on him out there badly. I was out and watched it. Which when you're hungry, I know you'll steal. When you're starvation, you'll steal. I, I was really mad then, but I couldn't get involved because if I had any strength, I could, but I was just shot myself. You can't steal food in there. You gotta, you know, you gotta suffer with the rest of us. But I know when you're desperate, uh, you you want to steal, but uh, you can't steal from your own people. Generally in the morning, the the British always has tea, and they had an old straw broom. You're supposed to sort of sweep around your bunk in the morning. I was sort of sweeping around the bunk. It was probably making a little bit of dust. The British sergeant said to me, you bloody yank, cut out that sweeping. Well, I said, you ain't big enough. I said, we can go outside and settle this quick. He said, I'll be the first one out. So out he went. I, I sat back down, I said, why don't you go out there? He, he'll beat you to a pup. You can't even raise your arms hardly. So I didn't go out. He come back in and yapped a few more times and that was it. But uh, I was in no shape to go out in, uh, in a fist fight the way I was. They wanted a wood, a volunteer for a wood detail. And I told Georgie, I said, well, well, we'll, we'll get involved in that. We'll see what's out there. And maybe if there's anything, any chance to escape, we'll look the situation over. So we got out in the woods and they had, uh, they had German dogs with them, the guards. So, and we couldn't, uh, Anything that was in the snow sticking out, wood we had to get, you couldn't touch anything on a tree. They wouldn't let you touch a dead limb on the tree, but anything that was sticking through the snow, we got arm load and brought back to camp barrel. Later, in about a week, uh, they wanted a detail to dig taters, and I says, well, we'll, we'll go on this detail because we'll load up with a batch of them and have something to eat. So we went out and dug taters in the ground, under, you know, in the ground there, dug taters. And we filled our field jackets and uh, underneath our jackets too, and the belt was holding a lot of them too, between our skin and the belt. But when we got to the gate, they were searching you, and they took all the taters away from us. They had quite a few there in baskets. We got Red Cross parcels maybe three different times, but there's about 15 on a box. Some of the boys traded the uh, food off for cigarettes, and they finally got so weak that they just laid there in bed and died. A lot run through your mind. You had a lot of time to think, and you're...
Yeah, the uh, since you uh, uh, had more time to think things over, uh, you never gave up or you just kept pushing. And you thought about your family back home and you wondered uh, how, uh, you always had a feeling that we was gonna win the war after landing D-Day and moving in and uh, they opened up the other fronts. You felt like it, you know, it'd be a matter of time, but uh, that we'd be uh, recaptured back. I had that feeling. I never gave up, I never gave up hope. When they came to the door, you always knew the telegrams were bad news back then, and I wouldn't go, Mother answered. And I said, is he, is he, is it dead or missing? And she said, missing. It seemed like I just felt better right off. It seemed like I just knew it was going to be all right. They just sent you a telegram to say the War Department regrets to inform you that, you know, so-and-so has been missing in action. And uh, they'd let you know if anything else, you know. I mean, they, it wasn't very long. It was just a few lines. There was this picture that came out in the paper. They take out the face, so it's just white, you know. I mean, they won't show faces. And it sure looked like Rick, and even his hairline, because he used to have curly hair, and he had one that all came down sort of on his forehead. Mother sat down with the paper. Well, she saw that picture, and she took it over, and Dan said, who does that look like to you? And they thought it was Rick, too. We finally found that picture, the real picture that the Germans took. And it wasn't him, but boy, it sure looked like him. They gave us sort of a, a postcard, and uh, we wrote home, I think, about three times. I didn't describe the condition at the camp because I figured they'd throw it away. So I just wrote uh, like everything was okay. That was sort of a help. He's glad that card, maybe get back and let him know he's a POW. I well, I got that one card, but still, that don't mean anything either, because he could die in prison camp, you know. And the cards were late coming. I mean, he wrote it in January, and I don't think I got anything till late March. Sunday night, the British commander made a statement. He said, uh, the guards have then left. They've taken off and gone. I've got to tell you, boys, that uh, the Russians are going to be here by morning. He said, the Americans will be here within two weeks. Everybody seemed to be happy. Some of them was burning the barracks down. So I told Georgia, I said, well, two weeks is too long for us. I said, we're going to make a run for it and see if we can end up back to the American lines. So we took off. And we come into the little village. We stole a couple of bicycles. We took off on the bikes. We came down to the Elbe River, we were surprised, we didn't know where, where the Elbe River was. We come down to the Elbe River and there was some civilians, uh, German civilians, so Georgia could speak a little bit of German. So he told him Germans we wanted to cross the river. So we put our bikes in the boat and they took us across the river on the other side. And we came to this little town nearby. We went up to the first house or the second one, knocked on the door and they let us in. I had to go to the bathroom. I went to the bathroom. While I was in there, I saw shoe polish. Of all things, worrying about my shoes. 
So I gave my shoes a sort of a dry run shine, and I came back out. Never did forget that. I came back out. She had the table set up. We had oatmeal and some type of bread toasted and some jelly. So we ate that, and uh, because they was real scared of us. And then we left after that on our bikes again. We came down, there was a bend in the road. All of a sudden, we heard uh, traffic coming, military vehicles coming. I said, boy, jump over the bank, quick. And we jumped over the bank and laid down on this uh, patrol of uh, German vehicles came rolling by, six or seven vehicles. They was really going at top speed around the curve and out of sight. We laid there until they got by, and I said, well, we won't go down this road. We'll have to go back on the main road that we was on before. So we went back to the main road again and started headed west again. Down the road there, we uh, spent the evening in the woods that night, stayed in the woods that night. Shouldn't be too much more. Then next morning, uh, we started out again on the bikes. Uh, I heard a noise, or maybe they hollered at us. Here, here was two soldiers coming at us with the rifles drawn. So we stopped. And generally, I, I was always paddling ahead of Georgia. He was generally bringing up the rear. So I stopped, and he pulled up and stopped. They came over, looked us over, and uh, took us down the road, maybe a uh, hundred yards down the road. Up on the left, there was uh, civilians and German soldiers up there. So they took us up there and they had a pal while there with Georgia, which could speak German. So uh, they, according to Georgia, they was gonna take us down to some other building. So they sent one soldier with us which uh, we had to go another probably uh, probably another 50 or 75 yards or farther. They got us again. Yeah, I said, boy, what else can happen to us? I said, boy, here, you know, I was figuring on making a clean sweep, and here, here we are whole, uh, delayed again and more or less recaptured again, more or less. And uh, they sent one guy with us, and we was walking with the bicycles, I said to Georgia, we got a little ways from them guys, and I said, Georgia, I said, I can stick around here and I'll break his neck. Oh, no, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll finish him off quick. And Georgia said, no. He said, don't do it, White. He says, uh, uh, otherwise, he said, they'll, uh, they'll catch us and shoot us. He said, uh, no, we'll see what happens farther down. So we went down and went inside this big building with a high fence. Uh, the guards let us in, and uh, they went and got a German officer. We chatted there a while, Georgia did with him. We showed him our dog tag, and he told him we was working somewhere, laboring, and they let us go. couple of shots and I said boy paddle give it the gun so we paddled fast we could and I said boy what else can happen first thing I know we were in patrol of uh, American troops but we really felt good because after what we've been through and uh, this is uh, really a turnabout so we really was happy and really contented we drove uh, 50 to 7500 miles back so we started scouting around a little bit. I found a building that was off limits. It had signs posted off limits. And I said, well, let's, let's go inside and see what we can find. We went inside the building and I found out it had electric heat and 
electric water, I mean electric heat, uh, uh, hot water and bath, electric stove. I said, well, gosh, we, we found a place for us to roost. I noticed chickens up on the side of the hill. I said, well, that's going to taste good. I said, I'm going to get a chicken. Well, I ended up inside of the chicken fence, uh, wringing one of them's neck. And the woman come out and shouting and hollering at me. So I got back over the fence and beat it back off the little hill. So I came back and I uh, baked that with uh, some butter, cleaned it and baked it with some butter. And boy, that really tasted good whenever we got that little uh, feast. My feet and legs started swelling up. I mean, I couldn't get, just could get my shoes on. So I told George I was going on sick leave. So I didn't give him my address, I didn't give him my name, and I didn't get his name when I left. So I went on sick leave, and they ended up throwing me in the hospital. The last time I saw Georgia, and the last conversation we had. I spent 10 months in the hospital. They shipped me to uh, uh, White Sulphur Spring, West Virginia, and I was put in the hospital now. But while there in the hospital, uh, not knowing that my brother was there, that was the next POW by the Japs, we happened to be going down the hallway and I run right into him, and we had quite a get together, quite a reunion, and he was surprised to see me and I was really surprised to see him. We sat down and talked about our experience, and he was stationed on Matan. He was on the death march, and he was telling about in the extent of heat and about the prisoners. Anybody fell out with either bayonet or shot. And once he got to Japan, he worked him in the coal mines, and uh, he he worked in the coal mines before he went in service, so he knew all about the mining. When I got back on leave, I finally uh, got a chance to see my son that was born uh, while I was overseas, and uh, also my wife Shirley and her folks. I was really happy and contented that what I went through, that I made it back safely, and, and very pleased and happy to see the whole group again. Coming back, you didn't figure, you thought everything was gonna be just simple and easy, but it wasn't to it. You had to adjust to life again, I think, you know, the, the people and everything else. It seemed like being a POW, lots of times you want to be, sort of be alone. Kids in my class, when I was going to school, uh, there wasn't that many of them that their parents would have, had been that directly involved in the war, you know. Uh, very few of them had even been in service, and certainly none of them had been, uh, in my, my particular class, none of them had been, uh, certainly no prisoners. I couldn't see any ill effects of, of his being a prisoner and being in the war as far as his mental state, you know, he always, uh, like I said, he just moved on, you know. That was then and uh, you got over it and you kept going, you know, what, what's next? It, and uh, he just consumed, went on living like he won't do what he wanted to do and, you know, he liked hunting so he hunted and, you know, had a good sense of humor and just went on with life, you know, he didn't let it, uh, hang up, you know, no big hang ups as far as I could see. Him or uh, any anybody that's uh, served and went through that, I certainly do a big tip of the hat to him and uh, even more prouder that he is my dad, you know. I was born 10 years after the end of the war. And Mike's nine years older than I am, so I remember hearing the stories ever since I was little. The older I got, the more detailed he, he got in, in retelling them. In the earlier days, it seemed like he recounted some of the 
the the lighter parts of it and he, it wasn't until later that I think he started opening up to the more troubling areas you know of the troubling parts of the things that happened so it was uh, well I think it was therapeutic for him to finally talk about it it seems like from what he talked about World War II veterans didn't come home usually and and talk about everything that happened to them which actually would have been better but at that time you know, it was just something you held in and you know it, today we talk about post-traumatic stress syndrome and here uh, for most World War II vets I don't think that they thought about that they just thought that they'd keep people here from here over here, uh, they didn't want them to hear what actually happened. They thought they would keep them safe by not telling them the truth of all the horrors that, that went on and not what they experienced. So I think the older he got, the more he went into some of this, some of the, the things that, that were really emotionally uh, disturbing to him about the whole episode. And in a way, I think it was a good cleansing experience for him to, to be able to tell people about it. He's not too keen on Christmas. Long about the time when he was captured and it's getting cold and, and like that, he, everything comes back to him more or less. So I know he's thinking about it. After uh, going through it and after you have the nightmares and and you think about it, you get up at night, it makes you appreciate that what I went through, I made it back alive. Rishol White retired after 25 years of civil service for the Army base at Fort Drum, New York. Today, it's an honor to be able to call him grandfather and friend. I recently visited the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C., a tribute to the 400,000 American soldiers who died, protecting the freedom of hundreds of millions. While there, I thought to myself, each one of these men, most of them in the younger part of their lives, men my age, had a life and a future which they never got to see fallen soldiers who were defending the freedom that we enjoy today. These men did not come back, but millions did. Men like my grandfather who were not unscarred. They have to live with the memories. This film is a tribute to all those, dead and alive, whose stories should never be forgotten. I know that my grandfather's experiences will be etched into my memory forever.